Imagine this life is over, and you're about to be reincarnated. Set your personal beliefs aside for a moment and just say that God, or a God, or just a higher power, is giving you your exit slash entry interview for round two on Earth. He, she, it, they, whatever, has already decided you're going to be a mammal. You were mediocre at being one the first time, and you're getting a second chance. And while the exact species remains undecided, God is letting you choose whether you want to be a male or a female. Now you might be thinking, who cares, right? Throw me in there, give me another run, whatever you think is best, God. But if you care about how well you do, this is actually a hard strategic choice. There are a few trade-offs to consider, but as a general rule, if you choose the female respawn, you're just more likely to reproduce, right? You're comparatively unlikely to be a complete failure on the mating market. But your ceiling is limited. Your maximum reproductive rate is going to be pretty slow. And the amount of times you can even reproduce at all are going to be somewhat few, at least compared to the males in your same species, most likely. If you choose the male route, that ceiling breaks. If you rise to alpha status as a male gorilla, or happen to be a ram with a particular gift for headbutting, you could sire more offspring than you could keep track of with a normal mammalian brain. But on the other side of things, the floor drops out. There's a high chance, in some species like elephant seals, a very high chance, that you will never reproduce. Many male mammals get completely outcompeted by their rivals and routinely rejected by females. In fact, this is arguably the normal condition for male mammals. Today, we're going to talk about those males in our species. I really don't think this topic is appropriate for children, and, and I think, frankly, it's going to be a little too dark to be enjoyed for most adults, so you can step off the ride now if you want. For those that remain, you all know that I'm the last to delineate us from other creatures. Maybe literally the last. I actually don't know anyone who thinks humans are less remarkable than me. I really do just think of us as a species of ape with an inflated ego, but one of the things that seemingly sets our species apart and I'm fighting for a better term here, is our identity ideologies. Groups where you can be a believer and a belonger. I think we're the first animal to come up with those. And one of these identity ideologies has been formed around the state of being unselected. This subset of animals that is as old as sexual selection itself has fashioned itself into a movement in our species a belief system, a culture, an ideology, a group that gave itself a name. A name that has become an insult somewhat analogous to loser and has simultaneously obtained an aura of fear. For many of you listening, terrifying historical tragedies will come to mind when I say their name, as when we say ISIS, as when we say IRA, incel. Today we'll discuss whether this reputation for violence is justified. Some of their card-carrying members are certainly terrorists, and some are violent, but that's not quite the same as the movement itself being violent. And I think describing the incel phenomenon as a terrorist movement would be a very low-resolution rendering of the issue. But we'll get into it. We'll also tackle incel's perception versus their reality, incel demographics, the roots of incel woes, incel mythology, fem cells, and potential solutions to inceldom both at an individual and societal level. And that's really not all. It's a long conversation. And in approaching these sensitive topics, I want to invite all the non-incels listening to bring their most compassionate self to this conversation. Yes, some incels are violent. It's a serious problem. Yes. Many of them hold genuinely repugnant views and say horrifying things, and that too is a serious problem. And yes, many of them are just really, frankly, difficult people to sympathize with. And as we discuss, ironically, for a few of them, their difficult to sympathize with personas likely explain their condition. 
But I think status-striving media types have done enough gleeful windmill dunking on incels. And I think we can be a little bigger-minded today. I think we can broaden our gaze to see inceldom both as a serious societal problem for the individuals threatened by it, that's victims of incel terrorism and misogynistic vitriol, and as a serious problem for incels themselves. Imagine, for a moment, if you were in a position where you had no romantic prospects. Imagine if, in your whole life, Nobody had ever once expressed attraction to you. Imagine if every single time you put yourself out there and asked someone out or expressed attraction to anyone, you were rejected, sometimes humiliated. Imagine not knowing that warm embrace. Imagine if your parents were the only people who would ever love you. I'm not defending or excusing violence or misogyny, not even close. But if some of these guys aren't their best selves, can you really not see why? And with that caveat-laden call to compassion, I welcome incel researcher, and as he likes to clarify, that's incel researcher, not incel, comma, researcher, William Costello. William is a rising star in the field of evolutionary psychology, he is the protege of Dr. David Buss, the most cited evolutionary psychologist in history who we've had on the show, and who has trained many of the risen stars in that field. Costello is one of the founding fathers of incel research, even though he is young enough to be the son of most academics. He has received a variety of awards and acknowledgments designed for graduate students, and while evolutionary psychologists typically aim for the past, because his work is so pertinent to modern mating, he has received a degree of attention that would be unusual even for a full professor in our field, and this trend continues on our show today. Thank you to the donors who make this show possible. Thank you, Eric and the Animals, for playing me in. And since I've been trying to schedule a conversation with William for most of a year, this really is, without further ado, a conversation with William Costello. What is an incel? So, uh, incel stands for involuntary celibate, and it can be understood as a largely online subculture community of men who form a strong sense of identity around their perceived inability to form sexual or romantic relationships. Now, you could broaden that definition out and say it applies to just a circumstance of a, a, a man or a person who is in the circumstance of being involuntarily celibate. But it's largely understood as this online subculture community, which consists of about 40 to 90,000 is the kind of estimate. But to give you an accurate kind of assessment, 20,000 is the current uh, active user number in the main incel forum, incels.is. And the community largely hang out online in kind of anonymous forums and can get very, very misogynistic, very, very fatalistic about the mating market and about their own um, chances in that mating market. They're very bleak about they're very bleak about their chances. They believe in something called the black pill, which is a derivative of the concept of the red pill from the movie The Matrix, which kind of describes uh, uh, taking the red pill describes seeing the truth for what it really is compared to the blissful ignorance of taking the blue pill. So for incels, the black pill describes a particularly bleak truth to swallow, the belief that there's nothing they could ever do to improve their romantic prospects and they should just accept that it's over. So it can be very, very uh, victim-oriented in mentality and uh, yeah, very uh, bleak in their outlook. Yeah, already just listening to you speak about this, um, the, the, one of the things that fascinates me about incels is that they've got this entire lexicon of terms and terminology, almost like a religious group or a, a kind of mythical tradition. But we'll, we'll get more into that later because I want to drill down on, um, I guess, the difference from your perspective as a researcher between, say, you know, the average dorky 20-year-old who is still a virgin and doesn't want to be, but doesn't explicitly identify as an incel, right? Like most 
you know, most virgins probably aren't making it part of their identity. And an incel with a capital I, so to say, someone who actually wears the flag. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction because, uh, you know, incel, it is an identity that must be embraced by an individual. It's, it's objectively impossible to prove that somebody can't form sexual or romantic relationships. So I suppose the big difference between a regular... I mean, we've always had incels throughout our ancestral history as well. There's been wide variation in reproductive success for males. A lot of men die before getting the chance to reproduce, and a lot more men maybe struggle uh, on the mating market than women. But the difference, what makes this group of modern-day incels very evolutionarily novel, is this idea of the black pill, the kind of retreating from the mating market. Typically, when you have a population of unpartnered young men in a society, they're actually very troublesome because they are status striving and risk taking in their behaviors uh, in, in terms of trying to get a mate, taking any chance they can. Uh, and, you know, the modern day incels are different. They're actively retreating from the mating market, encouraging each other to retreat and not uh, seeking mates. Uh, so that's very in interesting and peculiar. Who is the typical incel and what is stopping the average incel from quote unquote ascending, as they might like to say? So uh, there is a stereotypical kind of definition of or um, depiction of incels as the kind of basement dwelling, internet lurking guy who's got nothing going on in his life and lives in his parents' basement. And some of this stereotypical depiction is actually accurate in, in terms of the data that we've found. We've found that incels are highly likely to be neat, so not engaged in employment, education or training. They're highly likely to still live at home with their parents, even into adulthood. Um, so not just in younger years, into their mid to late 20s, when you might expect that they would have uh, gone out into the world. Interestingly, one stereotype about incels that isn't true uh, is that incels are actually a lot more diverse, uh, ethnically and politically diverse, than we would expect. Uh, typically in the media, you hear of incels being described as alt-right, far-right, or white supremacist adjacent. But we found in our data, and others have found in, in other samples, that there is actually more incels of color than would be expected by chance. So in our first sample, we had 36% of our sample were incels of color, um, which for a majority US and UK sample, that's quite overrepresented. So that, that's an unusual way in which they, they, in which they don't fit the stereotype. They are described as having a very big victimhood complex, and that's something we found in our data. We used the tendency for interpersonal victimhood scale, which is comprised of... Uh, so the tendency for interpersonal victimhood kind of is when somebody internalizes being a victim as a core part of their identity, and it's comprised of four dimensions. So number one is the need for recognition, a preoccupation with wanting your victimhood and the legitimacy of your victimhood claim acknowledged. So you'll recognize this in incels in that they prefer the self-verification of you telling them how bad it really is for them than it. the worst thing you could say to an incel is, oh, come on, you could get a girlfriend if you want. You just need to improve in these areas. They actually prefer the self-verification of being told, yes, you must really struggle on the mating market. You're five foot three, that will make it impossible for you. They actually prefer that. The second dimension is moral elitism. So that's the belief that one's self or their in-group behaves more morally than others. And with incels, you'll recognize this in the way they kind of sneer about the superficiality of the mating market. So they believe that women, or as they would call them, Stacys, are very superficial in desiring Chad, who is the sexually dominant, uh, desirable male uh, caricature that they depict. Uh, but they depict him as being very shallow, not very intelligent, not a good personality, but just because he's handsome, they think that Chad always wins. So incels might have a moral elitism of sneering at uh, the superficiality of the mating market, which they may have some point. I mean, sometimes the mating market is a little bit superficial, but uh, not always. Uh, the third dimension is lack of empathy. And this comes through with incels in that they believe that because of their 
experiences of being victimized that they feel entitled to enact pain on others. So nobody cares about my pain. Why should I care about yours? Is kind of the incel attitude. And the final um, component of the victimhood mindset is rumination. So this constantly um, replaying or ruminating on perceived instances of being slighted or victimized that kind of they get stuck in these patterns of thinking. And altogether, this victimhood mindset, it links quite well with the black pill, this kind of external locus of control. That there's nothing incels can do to affect change in their own life, that they just must accept that it's over. And they say things like incels should just lay down and rot and just accept that there's nothing they can do to affect change in their life. Just hearing the description of being in a state of rumination and having this really bleak outlook on life, it, it sounds like the typical state is some form of mental illness. How common or do we know how common mental illness um, or mental disturbances among incels? Uh, yeah, so in our first uh, study, it was all around incel mental health, and we found some really, really disturbing findings. So we were the first uh, researchers to use clinical measures to measure incel mental health. So in terms of depression, we used the PHQ-9, which is used by the NHS here in the UK. Um, and using that measure, we could clinically diagnose 73% of incels as severely or moderately depressed. In terms of anxiety, we used the GAD7, to, uh, which is again used by the NHS, and we found that 67% of incels could be clinically diagnosed as severely or moderately anxious. Uh, in terms of other mental health issues or um, uh, psychological issues, there's, there has been widespread reports of um, autism spectrum disorder among incels. So in previous data, 18% of incels reported having, uh, self-reported having an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. And that's like about 18% more than the general population. In our new study, um, which we've just closed collecting data on, we actually used the AQ10 scale, which is an autism spectrum disorder measure uh, designed by Simon Baron Cohen. Uh, to measure autism. And using that scale, we found that 15% would be uh, clinically diagnosable as um, eligible for an uh, autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. So yeah, uh, there's pretty dark findings around incel mental health. And incels are often talked about in terms of extremism. The take home message I would give to anyone who'd listen to me about our research is that if we think about extreme inceldom, it looks more like depression and suicidality than uh, potentiality for violence. And uh, I don't mean to demean any of the lives lost uh, to act, uh, uh, acts of incel violence, because in extreme cases, incels do turn violent. But there's been 59 people around the world killed in acts of incel violence. And if you think about that in comparison with other terrorist threats and incels are talked about as a potential terrorist threat uh, just to put that into context the terrorist group um, the Islamist group in Nigeria Boko Haram since 2002 they've killed 350,000 people and displaced 2 million people from their homes so it, in terms of threat I think it's often very important to put it into context but this idea of extreme inceldom looking like suicidality, uh, there's a lot of data that shows that the two biggest uh, predictors of suicidal ideation in men are failures in heterosexual mating and feeling burden, burdensome to kin. So when we think about incels being highly likely, obviously they struggle with the uh, the, the the sexual component and lack of romantic relationships but they also are highly likely to be neat and highly likely to be still living at home with their parents so they really typify these two extreme predictors of suicidal ideation among men when i hear the word incel though still i just imagine an overwhelmingly right-wing white misogynistic um and you know leaning towards violence identity group and I, I recognize that this stereotype in my head is media driven rather than data driven it sounds um 
but surely they are pretty misogynistic. Like I feel even when I'm reading their mythology, I feel like there's an underlying sexism there. Yeah, certainly a lot of uh, incel rhetoric online is deeply misogynistic. Now, how much of it is trolling, shit posting, as they describe, kind of almost like performance art? I mean, some of it, if you spend any time on their forums, it's so hyperbolic. It's like performance art. It's like uh, uh, just so untethered from reality uh, that it's hard to even take seriously at times. But we do know that unwanted celibacy, irrespective of incel identity, is actually predictive of misogynistic attitudes among men, and that men are most inclined towards misogyny when they doubt their appeal to female partners. So when they don't have much benefit to provide women, they go for like the cost infliction strategy and try and lower women's self-esteem. So what I think of incel collective misogyny is kind of like a an unconscious mating strategy as the group where they kind of collectively galvanize together to lower women's self-esteem and uh, you know like the idea of a cost infliction mate retention strategy from within the context of a, um, a, a relationship that's the only kind of collective mating strategy I can think that incels have typically they really are trying to hold each other back um, which is unusual but in terms of you're not wrong to get that impression because the stuff online is deeply misogynistic so for example 30 percent of incel threads are considered misogynistic but those are produced overwhelmingly by just 10 percent of super users online now you can't uh, account for how much tacit agreement is there by the lurkers in the forums and in our new data we're finding that a lot of incels simply don't engage when they're on forums. They just go on to, to read and to, to watch what's being said. So it's difficult to ascertain exactly how, um, how much agreement there is with this, but it is the case that an extreme vocal minority make a lot of noise for the community, and obviously an even more extreme rare minority actually commit violence. Um, so we should be careful not to judge them completely by the most vocal in their community, but there certainly is misogynistic slant, which makes sense given everything we know about them, you know, the the low mate value, the resentful, um, unwanted celibacy leading to misogyny, and this kind of feedback loop you get into if uh, you're consuming this stuff all day, uh, and if you're learning about your interactions, with women are basically what you learn on the internet from a sensationalist kind of YouTuber, uh, you'll come to these attitudes. I think there's a real risk there because what happens in the incel market um, or the incel ideological market doesn't stay there. I mean, terms like Chad's and Stacy's, alphas and betas, and these terms that they're so fond of have really proliferated through internet culture more generally. And so I think that if there is misogyny there, even if it's, you know, even if it's all bluster, it spreads in a way that's not bluster-like. I guess I'd also comment on the mating strategy side of things. It's a very interesting perspective to take on their behavior because a lot of it does suit, even though all of them or a huge portion of them are walking away from the mating market, their ideological posturing often does fit perfectly with a standard evolutionary psychological analysis of their behavior. It's like they're in verbal mate competition um, by constantly slut shaming women, right? So trying to reduce female promiscuity, um, so that way they don't, you know, lose more mating opportunities to higher status or more desirable males. A good portion of them are pretty hard on those trying to ascend, right? They hate pickup artists and guys who are, you know, coaching men um, how to succeed more with women. Yeah, as you say, there's this collective self-esteem reduction attempt where they're harassing women to lower their group level self-perceived mate value to make them more likely to settle. It's definitely an interesting way of looking at the phenomenon but i want to talk for a second about trolling so you mentioned trolling right so some of some of the incels who are posting sexist things 
they might not actually mean them, right? That they're just saying these things in order to troll. But one concern I have whenever I'm reading your research and incel research generally is that this group might just be saying stuff they don't believe to rile up the normies. How do you prevent yourself from being their dupe? How do you know they're not just academically cucking you by signing up to participate in your projects and then saying whatever is funniest or whatever is most politically convenient, right? Like some people are going to look at your findings, for example, that incels aren't actually particularly white or right wing or racist or their misogyny isn't actually that deep seated, at least not as much as the media says, and wonder whether this sort of surprising against stereotype finding is the result of deliberate sabotage. Yeah, it's a, it's a real concern because they're a very, very anonymous community and it's very hard to verify and it, the incel research is still in its infancy completely. But what we're finding a remarkable is a remarkable degree of consistency uh, kind of across the board in my studies, in other studies, that if they are doing this kind of dupe, they're remarkably organized and coherent in in giving the findings to us. Incels of color, for example, came through in every study that we've kind of seen. So it's, it's remarkably consistent. Uh, I also try and back up the findings with some qualitative interviews. I've done a, a bunch of those with incels uh, directly. Um, so they feel certainly a bit more, you know, authentic than a big quant study sometimes can be hard to, to trust. But I suppose, yeah, we just have to keep doing the research. And, you know, it's it's not likely that if we find that it's all a big mess, that every study that works with incels finds something different, you know, that then we can maybe say, OK, there's no point in direct engagement with this community. But, you know, just like any other community, they seem to be keen to talk. And, to, and I think that's why they maybe trust me a little bit more than other researchers is because they don't feel like I'm just trying to make them look bad. Changing the conversation towards one around mental health was one of the first kind of uh, directions I took with it. They seem to appreciate that. But um, yeah, it's just we'll have to see if the, the data keeps being kind of consistent or and it seems to be so far. But it is a real concern. Because this group is has the potential to be troublesome, you kind of have to be popular among incels to some degree or at least respected by them. That must be um, a little peculiar yeah and i think they just appreciate that i don't sugarcoat it about the struggles that they may indeed face on the mating market i take seriously the problems they represent and face in society uh, i hopefully don't come across as being like a mouthpiece for the incel movement i've said things that they're critical of there's some findings for example in our latest data we criticize the hell out of their mating intelligence for example and you know, our findings show that they don't really uh, have an accurate assessment of what women want. And that's not very popular in the incel community. But I think on balance, they see me as more fair and even handed and not trying to, uh, you know, just make them look bad as a, I'm not motivated to do that. Uh, so ho hopefully that uh, reputation will stay. Uh, but I do sometimes get the sense that I'm on borrowed time with the incel community, that one day there'll be a kind of a collective decision that I'm <laughs> no longer to be trusted or something. I, I hope not, but um, we'll see. Yeah, we will see. So w the basic picture I'm getting from you is that the really scary group of incels, they are a non-representative minority of the group. But how much of a threat is that minority? Most incels aren't violent. But how worried should we be about the ones that are? Well, primarily, we should consider that the extreme violence is most likely to be directed inward. There's no way to quantify that, really. There is some incel forums called incel graveyard and things like that, that, you know, show basically suicide notes from incels who never post again. Now, again, how much of that is just kind of performance art or, you know, um, sensational. It's hard to verify that. Uh, in our new data, we have some data on approval for violence. So there's, it was 5% said it is often appropriate for incels to react violently if incels are victimized. 22% uh, said it's sometimes appropriate. 
Uh, in big analysis of uh, the forums, other researchers found that just 1.39% of incel posts legitimize violence, which struck me as pretty low. Uh, in our new data, we found that incels, we measured them on the dark triad, so narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. And the incel, the average incel score was 38.53, which is slightly above average for the Dirty Dozen Dark Triad measure. The, the guys who developed the dark triad, this Dark Triad measure said anyone who scores upwards of 45 is considered very high Dark Triad. So we had 26% of our incel sample scored above 45. So we could say one in four incels is considered very high Dark Triad. Um, so it's, it's probably a case of there's specific ones to really watch out for, like in any extremist group, but the suicidality, that seems to be more evenly spread across the whole community and the, the poor mental health measures. That's kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, that seems more representative. I'm not going to lie. I actually expected more soothing numbers than, you know, one in four are very high dark triad, uh, one in 20 think incel violence is appropriate and one in a hundred posts are explicitly justifying violence that actually those numbers are disconcerting when we're talking about a group of at least 40,000 men now when we're talking about incels it does seem like we're always talking about men uh the phrase femcel is bouncing around in my head uh god knows where i went on the internet to get it but are there female incels? How are they reacted to by other incels? Yeah, so that's a, an area of research I'd like to move into as well. I'd love to do a femcel study somewhere down the line. Uh, the femcel community online uh, as like an analog subculture community to incels is actually growing. There was a recent Atlantic article about femcels that struck a very kind of sympathetic tone that I thought could have been applied to most incels, but it wouldn't really be done that way. Uh, incels don't really get a sympathetic hearing in mainstream media. But uh, the femcel idea, my thinking on it has evolved somewhat. So originally, I would have echoed what incels would have said about femcels. I would have said, there's no such thing as a femcel because... Most women, even if they're very unattractive, can go out and get sex or a relationship. They, it just might not be the sex or a relationship that they want, but they can get something. And for incels, and perhaps for men in general, there's a real failure of cross-sex mind reading here. Because for incels and men, maybe they think some is always better than none. For men, sex is like pizza. There is good pizza and there's pizza. There's no bad pizza. But for women and femcels, if the only sex or relationship that's available to you is sex or a relationship that you don't want, it's actually worse than nothing. It's very cost inflicting. Sex and relationships for women ancestrally and even now are potentially very costly. And, you know, uh, that, that's why women are more choosy. They, they, they have a lot to lose by choosing the wrong partner. So it, it amounts to the same thing. A femcel having no options she likes, is, it amounts to the same thing as incels not having any options. The, the way I can describe it is femcels have bad options, but incels often have no options. But in terms of a femcel community being underground and, uh, you know, kind of moaning about their prospects, I tend to think that the femcel or analog to incels for women is kind of hidden in plain sight. It's actually quite mainstream for women to moan about the, where are the good men? There aren't any good men out there. I mean, every week we see a new article about the lack of eligible men on the mating market and women are freezing their eggs because there's no eligible men anymore. And, you know, so I, I tend to think there's no need for an underground subculture of femcels when you can kind of exist in the mainstream and hold those attitudes about the lack of eligible men out there. But uh, I am keen to dig into some data on femcels and see where they're similar, where they're different. Uh, I tend to think they'll definitely have, just by virtue of being women, uh, less violent tendencies or less aggressive tendencies. But there could be uh, some similarities, maybe similarly high rates of autism spectrum disorder, maybe similar victimhood attitudes. Uh, we'll see.
I do feel that there is a experiential difference between everybody rejecting you, nobody wanting you, nobody wanting to be with you, and some people wanting to be with you, but those people aren't the ones you want to be with yourself. Do you disagree with that? No, I don't. And that's why I'm so interested and our lab is so interested in this idea of cross-sex mind reading, because there really seems to be a difficult thing to do to perceive things, perspective take from the position of the opposite sex. And one thing we're toying around with is this idea of maybe having an opposite sex sibling might help people understand. So I personally can kind of relate more to the incel idea of, oh yeah, I'd rather have some than none. But then I think, if I had a sister, would I, or a female friend, would I advise them, hey, just, I know that guy out there isn't really the guy you want at all, but just settle for him. It's better than nothing, right? I don't know if I would ever be able to bring myself to go that far. So I, I, I can kind of see both sides, but uh, it's definitely just failures of cross-sex mind reading for both. Yeah, as part of your research into the cross-sex mind reading stuff, it actually might be useful to check out some stuff from our lab on, um, you know, family composition and how that affects people's views and approaches to mating. So we see that in households with more, and maybe you're already aware of this research, but we see that in households with more females, more sisters, as you say, everyone takes on beliefs that are more helpful for women's mating strategies as opposed to men's mating strategies and in households with mo mostly males everyone takes on more male favoring beliefs uh, so i guess one way of thinking about this that um william you'd obviously be familiar with but i um i'll, I'll explain it for people at home it's like a family is like a hand where every member is like a finger on that hand and you're not seeing the underlying palm that's connecting them. Um, in reality, they all share genetics. And so they're all kind of working as a unit to reproduce to some extent, right? Like you'll care for your nieces and nephews and things like that. And our beliefs often favor uh, what, and we touched on this a little bit with the incels kind of adopting beliefs that allow them to compete for mates or at least kind of half-heartedly attempt to. We see that people adopt beliefs that favor their own mating strategies, but similarly, they adopt beliefs that favor the mating strategies of their overall family unit. So as you say, if you've got more sisters, you might be more sympathetic to the plights of the opposite sex. And um, it does seem that that's potentially due to just having more shared genes with the opposite sex, right? Like if, if Everyone shares 50% of their DNA with their siblings. And so if I have three sisters, then most of my genetic baton is actually in women's hands. And so it makes sense for me, uh, even from a selfish gene perspective, to actually adopt beliefs and practices that favor women more than men, even though I am a man. Yeah, absolutely. That's strong evidence uh, that the opposite sex sibling and this exposure, the, the genes element for sure, but also just the exposure uh, to their mindset and uh, being able to perspective take. I will say, though, that on the exposure point, that's everyone's first intuition with these um, sibling effects. But one thing that we do see is that even when a couple finds out the sex of their baby, right? So there's no increased exposure. They just know that they're about to have a boy. They know that they're about to have a girl. You see an immediate shift in their political orientations or mating relevant political orientations towards more uh women favoring beliefs or women's mating strategy favoring beliefs versus men's. Um, so for example, you find out that your girlfriend is pregnant with a daughter and you immediately become more pro-choice as a result. So there's no, there's not necessarily, I, I agree with you that there probably is an exposure effect, mm. um, but it's actually even more profound than that. It seems that our, it seems that our evolutionary psychology is sensitive to the proportion of our genes that are in the opposite sex's hands. Remarkable, yeah. For really, really cool findings. Yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll get back on the incel stuff. Uh, in, in this conversation, you've variously sounded like an incel cultural anthropologist at points, um, but of course, and, I, and I'll say this in the intro, but it's worth sitting again here. You're an evolutionary psychologist. You're uh, Dr. David Buss's latest disciple. Why are evolutionary psychologists interested in incels? 
Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, well, what got me interested in the topic was number one, selfishly from a career point of view, I thought this is the sweet spot of a research topic because it's got lots of mainstream media attention, but there's been very little empirical research done. So I can get in at the ground floor and be an early adopter and have a founder effect. So that was a, a good career move on my part. But uh, I'm also was genuinely just interested in the topic because I feel like the incel cultural phenomenon is exactly where our evolved mate preferences and mating psychology meets cultural innovation. You know, even the fact that you can have a group of incels collectively galvanizing together around this shared identity of failing at mating is evolutionary novel. I also was interested in what are the evolutionary novel aspects of the modern mating market that are creating this culture of incels. Um, but above and beyond that, I was also interested because incels often misappropriate findings from evolutionary psychology uh, to fuel their kind of misogynistic worldview. So I thought it was appropriate that someone from our field steps up and engages with the topic. Uh, I wasn't happy to just let, just to say, oh, yeah, they misappropriate our findings, but so what? They're 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 doing it, they're wrong. You know, you should actually engage with the topic. And since then, a lot of evolutionary psychologists have got in, um, got in on the topic, including your supervisor Candace Blake and Rob Brooks did some great work uh, analyzing incels from an evolutionary perspective, which can be the most informative, I think. So uh, it's appropriate. Yeah, I agree with you that it is appropriate. I mean, it, it, incels are in some way an evolutionary phenomenon, right? We've always had this cast of males in uh, as as long as there's been sexual selection, there's been this group of males and in, in select species group of females, depending on, on if they're, you know, quote unquote, sex role reversed, as some might say. There's always been this group that is unselected. And it, it seems like we're the first species where this group has gained self-awareness and formed an identity around it and also forms yes. a mythology around it right incels have built this really vivid mythology partially informed by evolutionary psychology as you say and partially misinformed by misinterpretations of evolutionary psychology but still they, they love the evolution stuff and it's filled with all these characters, right? We've, we've mentioned Chad's and Stacy's and there's vol cells. Um, I said fem cells at one point. Uh, they, all, they say alphas and betas, although that or betas. And that comes from, you know, uh, other places as well. They've got all these characters. Can you give me some flavor for what their whole myth is? Like what, what, what's their story of how the mating market works? Yeah, so what you said earlier in the conversation about incel vernacular or incel lexicon kind of spreading out all around the internet and becoming more widespread, I think they would love to hear that. They love this idea of them being these underground subversive culture warriors that kind of create internet culture because that's a domain in which they can reign rather than real society where they feel they can't ascend the hierarchy. Uh, so yeah, they've got lots of mythological terminology. You could write a book on the lexicon of the incelosphere, but it would be out of date within a week because they evolve their language so, so frequently. Um, huh. And actually some of the terminology gets a lot more dark and derogatory than some of the ones you mentioned, but I, I know there's some kids that listen to this. But yeah, it'll have an explicit tag on the episode and I'll, I'll give a warning. This definitely isn't uh, this definitely isn't an episode for families, but continue. Okay, good. Uh, I'm actually writing a commentary on an incel article right now and I'm challenging the idea, the, the claim that incels are very, very racist. But, and I make the claim that incels, if they are racist, which they are in their terminology, their terminology is often very derogatory, but I, I make the claim that they're equal opportunity offenders. There's nobody, they don't favor any group really. They have a derogatory term for everyone and they kind of self-label themselves with derogatory terms. Uh, they do have some uh, mythology like uh, that you could categorize as being racist. So JBW means just be white, but that describes their concern with racism on the mating market. So they believe that white men are favored by women of all races. And, you know, there is some 
evidence of that. They're not, there is a nucleus to tru of truth there in some data, uh, but incels obviously take it to the extreme and develop this idea of JBW, just be white. Another potentially racist um, idea that incels have is this idea of C-maxing, which is, stands for Southeast Asia maxing, which means that you could, as a man in the West, you could up your chances on the mating market by geographically locating yourself in Thailand or somewhere like that. And again, a probably some degree of truth, rightly or wrongly, probably uh, a man would fare better on the mating market there. Uh, but central to incel philosophy is the black pill, of course, that's the main thing. But in terms of how they think the sexual marketplace operates, they're firm believers in the idea of LMS, looks, money, status. That's the order in which they believe that uh, women form their mate preferences. And it's not so well supported by a lot of the literature because a lot of the evolutionary psycho psychology literature will show that men prioritize physical attractiveness more so and women prioritize things like uh, status more so. But incels very much believe in this idea of looks money status as that's the order of preference. In terms of other evolutionary psychology findings, they kind of bastardize. They really enjoy the findings of Tony Volk about bullying. So Tony Volk has done uh, big research into the uh, adaptive properties of bullying. And he finds that throughout history, bullies uh, receive more of the three R's, uh, reproductive opportunities, resources, and reputation. Uh, so incels really latch on to these findings and say, oh, that means women like bullies. Uh, they latch on to findings about dark triad men having more success in short-term mating. And they assume then that the only conclusion to reach is that women just like bad men. Uh, so they're kind of things that they use to fuel their mythology. And this idea of looks money status really comes through in their favoring of the dual mating hypothesis. So this idea that women will marry one man for his resources and cheat on him with another for his genetic material. And, you know, genetic rates of cuckoldry uh, are actually quite low when we, we, we dig into them. Uh, so how prevalent this strategy, which obviously exists for some women for sure, uh, but how prevalent or how typical that is of the female mating strategy is less obvious. But incels, you very much get the sense from them that nothing is ever good enough. So even if they were to become married, they would still have the inkling in their head, oh, well, she's just using me for my resources and is going to be off sleeping with Chad. That's obviously what's going to happen. So, you know, I ask incels in my interview, interviews with them, how would you know you're no longer an incel? What would have to change? And, you know, would you have to have sex once, one relationship, multiple relationships? What, how would you know? And they all seem to say a similar thing, that they describe it like alcoholism, that they could always have a, a relapse that they could go back to incel typical thinking. So in that sense, incel is very much a worldview or a mindset rather than an actual condition or circumstance. That's absolutely fascinating. And I didn't know that. Why do, you, do incels think they're failing to find a mate? So you mentioned looks, money and status. Is there a view of, the, of that accurate or how inaccurate is it? Uh, it's somewhat inaccurate, so this idea of looks, money, status. Uh, male mate value is considered to be much more malleable than female mate value. You can always accrue more status, you can always, uh, it's easier to impress with your personality. There's not many men who are being knocked, their hair blown back by a woman's sparkling personality. They tend to judge by the physical attractiveness far more than women. Um, so incels will say things like sense of humor doesn't count when you're ugly. And to some degree, they're kind of right that there are thresholds to these things that in order for your sparkling personality or your intelligence or your humor to shine, that it, it's important that you're a, a certain degree of attractiveness. So in our data, we found we measured incels perception of female mate preferences, and we found that incels and uh, non-incel single men alike made similar mistakes. So they over 
perceived the importance of physical attractiveness and financial resources, and they under perceived the importance of uh, intelligence, kindness, humor, personality. And you could make some case that incels hear about those findings and they say, oh yeah, well, women just lie on the surveys. And you could make some case for that. You could say, okay, there's some degree of social desirability bias. We know from a lot of data that women do indeed value financial resources uh, in a mate. So maybe there's some degree of that going on. But there's also a ton of data showing that women do value personality, intelligence, kindness, humor. If you even look at the divorce data, it's most often uh, out of lack of kindness is the most often the cited reason for divorce. He just started being mean to me. So it absolutely is the case that women in cells might not be so wrong in how much they perceive women value financial resources, but they're definitely wrong to under perceive the importance of intelligence, kindness and humor. Right. And and my impression of incels is that to some extent, uh, at least some of them have either attempted to or want to attempt to change their looks uh, through what they call looks maxing. I actually think that's a term they invented. Another one, which has really been successful at exporting itself. In this context, are they also trying to fix their mental health or improve their personality or um, get rich. Like I, I almost never hear incels talking about, oh, I, you know, I want, I want to really work on my side hustle and get loads of money and get educated and obtain positions of power. Are, are they trying to do things other than fix their looks, right? Like, like are any of them learning to play instruments and stuff or doing any of the things that women often find attractive? Not much evidence of that, but the, anecdotally they would say, um, you know, it's like the incel position of being black pilled means that they're kind of not extending much effort at all. That they're, they're accepting that there's no point in even trying. Uh, but given that their philosophy is LMS, their priority is to try and look smacks first because they say no amount of money or status will get you a fair, a fair hearing if you don't have the, the L, the looks. Uh, uh, first. But the looks maxing is uh, an area I'm really keen to get move into with my research on incels now. I'm really keen to do an objective mate value study where we get uh, female participants to rate um, anonymously rate in the lab uh, attractiveness ratings of incel faces. Because there's all sorts of reports about incels undergoing extremely invasive cosmetic surgery for their faces and even their height. Uh, there's uh, articles written about how you can gain a couple of inches in height if you have your legs smashed and rebuilt and it's in, uh, incredibly kind of dangerous side effects. And that's a, a kind of a, a blossoming industry for people now. And originally I was kind of squeamish when I would read these articles about cosmetic surgery and the way they would describe it is like, oh, incels are having their faces smashed in order to improve their attractiveness. But then I kind of thought, women have been engaging in cosmetic surgery, which you could describe in as gruesome a terms of, oh, a nose job. Oh, she got her nose smashed and rebuilt. It sounds kind of gruesome. But if we can do a study and find definitively one way or the other, whether incels are accurate about their assessment of their attractiveness, inaccurate, whether they're accurate about the specific feature, there's an argument to be made that perhaps cosmetic surgery could be a route uh, to improving incels' mental health. There's even some reports about in the UK on the NHS, so the National Health Service, that some women have, I don't think many, I'd like to know the exact figures, but some women have got boob jobs on the NHS subsidized because it's affecting their mental health. So if we could definitively prove mm. One way or the other, where, whether incels have cognitive distortions about their attractiveness, which is highly possible that they have this distorted view of their own attractiveness, that's useful. Or if we find that they're actually accurate and accurate about specific features of their face or attractiveness that are detracting from their chances, I think that's important information in terms of any interventions uh, with incels. So my position on the cosmetic surgery is somewhat softening. It's kind of like... <laughs> I'm taking a feminist slant on it. If, if it's okay for women, wh why is it not okay for men? Why should w women be expected to undergo cosmetic surgery to improve their attractiveness? But yeah, I, t I tend to think that the maxing is good all round, 
But incels will say to you, oh, well, there's no amount of sparkling personality that can overcome an ugly face. And uh, your personality is perceived as more sparkling if you are attractive anyway. We know that there is a strong halo effect. So the, the example I always use is height because I happen to be about five foot seven myself. So there are some women for whom no amount of sparkling personality, intelligence or humor will overcome that idea of being five foot seven. That's a pretty, that's one mate preference that women seem to have a strict boundary on, uh, unfortunately for me. But uh, yeah, the, the looks maxing I'm very keen to explore in future research. Yeah, I hope you were on that study. And on the, you know, if it's okay for women, it should be okay for men point. I think you're being very based, as they would say. <laughs> on the look side of things, my impression has been, and this is really not research informed, it's, it's just kind of amateur looking in has been that they're a little misled. I, I, I totally agree that some people are going, some men especially, are going to be so ugly that nobody will date them. And that's really, really sad. But I do feel that a lot of them focus on looks because it's less personal and painful than focusing on personality, right? Like it's 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 just less hurtful to say I'm the ugly duckling and that's why nobody wants to date me than it is to say, oh, I'm actually very annoying and I'm insufferable and that's why women don't want to date me. Not to bring up a, a kind of unpleasant name here, but when I look at photos of, I believe his name is Elliot Rogers or Elliot Roger, he's the incel terrorist um, who started it all, I believe, in terms of incel violence, if I'm not mistaken, at least official incel violence. When I look at photos of him, I, I mean, I just just being frank, I think he's better looking than me. And I've never had issues finding dates, right? Like he looks like a conventionally attractive male to me. And it seems that his perception of himself is wrong. And then when I look at these kind of vice news online documentaries of incels where they actually show their faces, I'm often just bewildered by the fact that they think it's their looks that are holding them back. I'm like, mate, walk out in the street. I see 20 blokes outside now who are worse looking than you and are happily married or or have a girlfriend or, you know, what's your what's your take on my perspective there that they're actually um they're actually often quite misled about what's holding them back and that they think it's looks when in reality they look fine. Yeah, I think I think you could be right. And that's kind of the empirical question we'd be trying to get at. When you think about even what we know about the objective mate value of incels above and beyond how accurate or inaccurate they are about their attractiveness, highly likely to be neat, highly likely to be still living at home with the parents, highly likely to be depressed, anxious, ASD, all of that isn't building a picture of uh, enticing prospect uh, as a mate for a woman. Living at home with the parents still, all of this delayed adolescence, you know, so even before you get into the, the physical attractiveness thing, there's enough there that's probably, you could say, that's holding you back on the mating market before anything else. Right. I mean, there are men out there who are objectively very ugly Sorry, not to. I don't. I don't know if there's a more sensitive word I can use for ugly, but objectively not good-looking blokes, who you know they have a good career. They're a super nice guy. They've got a good sense of humor. Uh, they don't have ASD or any clear mental health disorder to go along with it, and girls like them. So, so I, I just don't see. I don't. I don't see the focus on looks as you know a clear-headed thing, but I, I agree. I do, I do hope you do the research on looks. I, I would be, I would be surprised if they weren't at least worse looking than average. And yeah, I agree that if, if looks is the problem for some, then bring on the cosmetic surgery. Cause I'd love to see less, you know, human suffering. Exactly. And then if you, you measure longitudinally, whether these surgeries have actually an impact, a positive impact on their mental health. But just one more thing on the mating market struggles. There's also probably a likely bi-directional relationship with the misogyny. So in our latest paper, we talk about how, you know, misogynistic men who are resentful about women they don't exactly make for an enticing mating prospect for women either. I get the sense that women can very much sense when a guy has a 
resentful attitude towards women or a misogynistic attitude, and that's not going to be uh, attractive to them. So the we know from data that unwanted celibacy creates misogyny, but it's also likely bidirectional that the misogyny repels mates as well. Yeah, and this is one thing that uh, that I've actually talked about with Candace. It, it, it's just this unusual trait about incels with a capital I, right? The 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 card carrying members is that they tend to have a lot of resentment towards women, but a lot of similarly low status men actually adopt very feminist beliefs in order to compete, right? So it's like, look, I'm, I might not I might not be as good looking as him. I might not be as strong as him. I might not have the same money as him. I might not be that funny, right? I might have all these disadvantages, but at the end of the day, I'm a really nice guy. I'm going to treat you right. And I don't have heinous views about women. Um, a lot of men go that route. And these guys seem to, you know, leave the only card they could pull out um, in their pocket because they're, they, they really are hurt and they really do have a lot of um, spite in them. And yeah, maybe, maybe sometimes it's the cart um, getting put in front of the horse. The, the pure idea of mating effort is important. So, you know, it's hard to quantify just how much effort incels are indeed making. And I get the sense that there's so much incentive to not try so incels hold each other back they'll kick each other out of the forums if they report any semblance of romantic success so the mo and they might be very very sensitive to rejection so the most romantically and sexually successful men i know they are willing to be rejected over and over again 99 times and then the hundredth time they'll be successful the only thing that i would personally perceive there is that yes, rejection is anxiety inducing and the mating market is anxiety inducing, but you get the sense that it's worth it on the other side. But then I step back a little and say, who am I to tell socially anxious young men who are incel, who have very negative self views, that they should continuously pick themselves up and go out on the gauntlet again and get rejected 99 more times because it's worth it in the end. I don't know, it's always been worth it for me and romantic relationships have some, been some of the most gratifying experiences in my life. But is that the case for other men? It's hard to know for sure. We've been dancing around this point for, for an hour and 19 minutes now, so I, I, I think it's actually smart to just face it. So the in and incel means involuntary, which implies that all of them want to have sex, right? Like none of them want to stay celibate or they wouldn't be group members. And, and I, I know this will sound like a stupid point after we've been chatting about just that for an hour, but uh, bear with me. So that puts this identity group in a weird position where to be in it, you have to want to not be in it, right? And to achieve a very basic human goal means to be thrown out of the club. So you mentioned incels holding each other back. You mentioned them getting kicked out of forums for quote unquote ascending. When an incel has sex or loses their incel title, are they disparaged by their community or congratulated? And, and aren't they all trying to get out at some level? Don't they have to be trying to get out? I mean, you mentioned the black pill thing, but uh, I was under the perhaps mistaken impression that many of them are actually putting in mating effort trying to get out um, and haven't quite given up yet, but they're still incels. I would think that if they are putting in mating effort, it's kind of behind the scenes and they're not exactly getting encouragement from their other incel buddies about keeping trying. If they talk about the efforts they're making on the mating market, other incels in the forum will just disparage them for being, they'll call it cope. So incels have three rhyming domains of where you can be in relation to the black pill. You can have hope, cope, or rope. So hope refers to the little bit of hope that you could change your mating prospects. Cope refers to being kind of self-deluded and uh, coping mechanisms like uh, doing something else instead of focusing on uh, ruminating about your lack of mating success. And rope refers to suicide, which is the darkest area of the black pill. But yeah, I think the commonality is not that they're incel and trying to break out of it. That would almost be more encouraging to see a community like that saying, look, we're really struggling. We all have it really hard in the mating market, but here are 10 things we can do to keep trying. Instead, it more leans towards the black pill of it's over. You shouldn't bother trying. You should lay down and rot. So there's a recent high profile case of a, a moderator of an incel forum who ascended and 
this Rolling Stone article came out where the journalist was totally bemused by the fact that a lot of members of the community were disparaging towards this incel for ascending. But that makes total sense to me because an individual incel ascending puts a lot of pressure on the others that they should be doing something similar. If it can happen for him, that means it's not always over. I could actually improve. Maybe I should be trying harder. So it's actually preferable for them to surround themselves with people who verify their worldview that there's no point in even trying. Um, so the incentive structures of the incel identity are all wrong in terms of motivating them to get back on the mating market. When I started studying this topic, I thought, how could somebody find such a strong sense of identity in such a unusual aspect of their identity? But I realized quite quickly that incels get a lot out of the coalitional psychology of incel identity. They get a sense of fraternity, a common enemy, a black and white rubric through which to view the world. They get a victimhood identity. They get a, like we talked about, a rich lexicon of humorous trolling in-group terminology that they can see is beginning to kind of uh, pervade cultural discourse. That's kind of a, a, a unique sense of power almost where they otherwise feel powerless. And if you trade that strong identity and all the incentives behind it against a place in an anxiety inducing, expensive, exhausting mating market that they don't feel they have a chance in, uh, you know, that, that that's a, so I'm writing this commentary paper now on a paper that describes incels as coalitional bargaining for sexual access. And we spoke a little bit about how that might be true in terms of the collective misogyny to try and lower women's self-esteem. But I think that incels are actually evolutionary novel compared to ancestral groups of incels, which may have been coalitional bargaining for sexual access. I think that modern day incels engage in coalitional bargaining, but specifically do not bargain for sexual access. They actually actively try to hold each other back uh, and themselves because the little bit of hope is more psychologically disturbing to them than, uh, th th than um, no hope. But the interesting question for me really is, given what we know about young male syndrome and groups of incels ancestrally being so troublesome, causing a lot of, a lot of crime and violence, we should actually expect that modern day incels would be way more violent. And yes, there has been instances of uh, violence, but very rare. And there's been no spike, uh, corresponding spike in violence uh, associated with this increasing sexlessness or increasing delayed adolescence. And one idea we have there is that just the internet and these online worlds might be just pacifying incels and kind of hijacking their status driving psychology and saying, you know, you don't need to go out and take risks in the real world. Uh, you just com continue trolling and shit posting and striving for status in this virtual world. Yeah, their reluctance to let in hope really does remind me of the quote by Marion Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It's almost more uncomfortable to admit that there's the possibility of success than to let go and sink into the black pill. It, it, it might be of interest to you. I, I did discuss the point about them not being as violent as we think with Rob Brooks. And our kind of take was that the incels who are the, you know, incels lowercase i who are being violent probably are, are the ones who are competing hard enough so that they actually ascend, right? And so it's kind of a self-selected group where, you know, there, there are would-be incels who, who share a lot of commonalities with them, but because they're more aggressive status strivers, they do things like join gangs or um, join military groups um, in whatever region they are globally. And that gives them ultimately, you know, a, a very disturbing but effective path towards ascension. Now, I, I, know, you won't, I know you won't advocate violence um, or, or I'm praying to God you don't, as I'll have to edit it out. But what's your advice to incels who want to share, shed their identity, right? What, what would be your advice, if you have any, to someone who's in one of these groups, but they're in the hope section of the, um, of the black pill tripart? 
how many of them do you think could get a girlfriend? And then what would be your advice be to them? And then kind of as a side note, I'm just curious, uh, would prostitution count in their eyes at all? Uh, I, I would love to hear your take on, on those few points in whatever order you wish. Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to pick up on the previous thing you said, because it's very interesting to me. And it is a case of we might be careful what we wish for. Uh, the tendency is to think, oh, let's create interventions that guide incels back towards the mating market. And everyone is very worried about the danger, the threat of incels. But what's really dangerous to women is a insecure, jealous boyfriend who has a deep seated misogyny in them. That's kind of dangerous. So if we, you spoke about how the incels who have a little bit of hope might be the ones who engage in the crime or status striving. So it's kind of a, a bleak finding of, oh, actually it, it could be potentially dangerous to guide a lot of these men back towards the mating market. It could be a, we might need to do an incremental, there, there could be a lot of kind of mindset changing you'd need to do first before that. So I just wanted to pick up on that. Uh, in terms of advice to incels, I'm a big believer in the kind of personal development route, you know, that there's a lot, lots you can do as a man to develop yourself. But what's interesting is that even when you attach the goal of achieving romantic success towards any type of male development, it gets framed as misogynistic somehow. And that's always been strange to me because it's very intuitive to men, I think, to develop yourself with the view of getting romantic success, like the archetype of get the goal, get the girl. That's kind of Disney. And you, you dream about that stuff since you're like eight years old. Um, so it's this idea that it's misogynistic to develop yourself with the goal of attracting women. I think it's because the red pill and the pickup artist worlds get so corrosive. But uh, I'm kind of optimistic there too. I don't think the mating market is so opaque that you can't learn anything about it. And I think it's sinister when people try to suggest that it is. You know, it's um, there's a lot you can do to learn about how the actual mating market works. So advice for incels I would give is try to cultivate more broad friendships. So there's a lot of data that show that incels just lack friendships more broadly. So, you know, that used to be a place where you'd meet a romantic partner is through your friends. You'd meet their cousin or they'd have a friend coming into town or something like that. Broaden your social networks is a big um, a piece of advice I would give. I would also give the advice of trying to narrow down your domain of your status hierarchy. So me as a psychologist, I'm not going to have much romantic success if I'm going trying to pull women in the nightclub at 1 a.m. next to the jacked gym bro guy. Those aren't the type of women who are going to be impressed by me. But at an academic conference or at a debate festival or something like that, I might ask a really insightful question or make an insightful comment that will really impress someone. So you really have to zero in on narrowing down your status hierarchy because the, te the temptation now is, oh, it's all just online. So I'm up against, it's me up against the whole world in the online dating apps. So that doesn't help either. Um, but also, yeah, so that uh, I still believe in the self-development route, but uh, I am willing to accept that it may not be the right move for every incel always, that uh, it is possible that it is indeed too anxiety inducing uh, for some. Uh, yeah, I think that's bang on. I, I especially think that your insight about choose where to compete carefully is really uh, well thought out just because... A lot of these guys seem to have a bad taste in their mouth from attempting to ascend through dating apps or, as you say, in nightclubs where really looks are kind of the main thing that matters. It, 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 those mating markets are basically how tall are you, how handsome are you, how muscular are you. But your point that there are lots of mating markets where those things actually seemingly come second or at least come in a less important position um, yeah, I, I think that's dead on, I, I guess as, as kind of a tag along question, I actually feel really bad for this group of humans, uh, especially in the many individual cases where my sympathy isn't blunted by extremism or misogyny. Uh, all of, all of these blokes really are 
just terribly unfortunate. Uh, and uh, if some of them are wrong and they could get a girlfriend, uh, assuming that there isn't the issue and, and maybe there would would always be of them just being bad boyfriends once they got one, I, I think that's a legitimate cause for concern. But assuming that they could do a good job at that, I think it's a very sad thing for them to be wrong about, right? Like it's sad for some of these guys to be blackpilled when they actually don't need to be, when they actually could end up in a positive or mutually positive relationship. So uh, I guess, as, again, as a tagalong question, do you have any ideas for how we could change things at a societal level to make the mating market less insufferable for this group of less than average desirability? Oh, in terms of how I would alter the mating market, I mean, I could talk at length about how the dating apps are kind of corrosive in that they focus in on static uh, data points of information like your height and like your uh, qualification or whatever it is. Uh, but the dating apps is the dating world now. I don't think we're going to row that back. That's You've got to be on them. I remember talking to my colleague when I used to work in England and she was really keen to meet a guy. She was a single mom and she would not go on, she would not go on the dating apps. And I said, Amy, you come to the office in the morning, you work all day and you go home on the train, you eat and you go to sleep. If you're not on the dating apps, where are you going to meet somebody? You're going to meet someone right. on the train or on your lunch break. That's it. That's what you're limiting your chances to. So as bad and all as the dating apps might be, I think you've got to be on there. That is where you will potentially be seen or have a chance. And I get the sense that men are just not very good at creating dating app profiles. I feel like getting a woman in your life as a friend who can give you guidance on how to take a better photograph, how to design a better profile. I think that would be a huge one for the dating app um, profile building. I think that's important. But in terms of how I would what I would encourage society to change rather than trying to change the dating app or the, the mating market, I would advise people to just have a more sympathetic tone towards incels and not judge them by the most extreme actions of a minority. Try to consider that this is real social suffering and that maybe we could put less emphasis on the sexual component of inceldom and just view it as a more broad social isolation. You know, these are guys who lack friendships more broadly. They just don't have a lot going for them in their life. They're, uh, they're struggling and improving the material conditions of young men's lives in education, in the workplace, uh, could, be, could it impact their mating prospects in one fell swoop. You know, men are really not succeeding in education. They're being outpaced by women at huge rates. And that is all affecting the mating market and the lack of eligible men out there for women to choose from. So, you know, there are people like Richard Reeves who wrote that book of boys and men, who's kind of banging the drum about how men are losing out in education. So that could be a, yeah, improving the material conditions of men's lives could be impactful. All right. Wonderful. Well, William, that's all I've got for you. Uh, but we've been planning this for about half a year now and uh, it was well worth the wait. I'll be continuing to uh, keep an eye on your work, and I'm really glad somebody is doing it because it's slightly too depressing for me. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Mackin. Thank you again to William. I've linked ways you can keep up with him in the show description. I'm sure we'll be hearing more from him over the coming years. Thank you again to all the donors. Species is entirely funded by pure generosity, which is something that I'm very proud of and is a testament to the quality of the audience more than anything. And I could not be more grateful for the support. The donate button is at mackinmurphy.org. Just scroll down to where it says species. There's a little button which you can click to donate. Much of my work is now short form on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm pretty easy to find on all those websites, but it always feels good to come back here where we have a little more breathing room. So until next time, have a great week and remember to be kind to animals.